Grace and peace to you all this morning. We're glad to have you worshiping with us at Amity um, here or online, and a particular welcome to those visiting. Um, I'm Ann Carney, and I am a member here. M Megan is away on study leave, so um, you're going to hear a little more from me than you normally would a worship leader, but um, I want to introduce to you our guest pastor, Nicole Thompson. Nicole is a member at um, the Grove Presbyterian Church and um, is also a social worker in Mecklenburg County and um, has been preaching in a whole variety of churches and denominations for over 20 years. So welcome. We're very glad to have you helping us in worship today. Um, what else? Are there any, is there anything, because I don't, I don't have a plan to announce anything, just if there's anything anybody wants me to say out loud, just make sure you look at the announcements. Somebody has something, Carol. I want to welcome our friends from the Congo. Last week, Pastor Ann Carney was here and she was preaching and Yes, thank you. I mean, they're Americans. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank you. And we do, we're so glad that you all are here. Yeah, that's, it's on the bulletin, but I will mention that next Sunday, Sarah Simmons, our intern who has been here this year, next Sunday is her last Sunday. Um, she will be here. But we are trying to collect what is being called a love gift for her financial donations to just give her something before she leaves because she has been a lovely presence. There's probably people who have not met her yet, but she's, she's usually here on Wednesdays for the bowl. Okay. You are invited to stay seated as we sing our gathering song. As we breathe into worship this morning, we remember the holy anger at injustice that we explored last week. Our breath prayer today invites us to trust that God gave us to one another to seek justice and to repair what is broken. So close your eyes, find your stillness in your mind and your body, and breathe. I am made for community. We get free together. I am made for community. We get free together. I am made for community. We get free together. Now that we have breathed deeply, let us rise and sing hymn 411, Arise, Your Light Has Come. Arise. 
light, your light is come. The Spirit's call obey. Show forth the glory of your God, which shines on you today. Arise, your light is come. Fling wide the prison door. Proclaim the captive's liberty, good tidings to the poor. Arise, your light is come, all you in sorrow born. Bind up the broken-hearted ones, and comfort those who Arise, your light is come, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's power will make us strong. Be seated. When we offer our confession to God, we join the beautiful work of reconciliation, which begins with reconciling with God. Trusting in our partner in grace, let us make our confession first in silence and then with the printed prayer. Let us pray. And now praying together. God of justice, we confess the ways we get so lost. We desire unity, but often we seek it on our own terms. We want reconciliation, but are unwilling to make repairs. We hope for change, but we keep choosing our comfort. Forgive us, Lord. Unsettle our hearts and make us ready to have our hearts changed and to be change makers in systems and practices that cause harm. <coughs> Teach us the meaning of justice and the depth of your grace. Amen. Siblings in Christ, trust in the love and grace of God. We are made new we can begin again. We are free to live in the light of God's redeeming love. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. There aren't any children, Donna. Do you want to come on forward? <laughs> are children today so uh, you know when you do a lot of research and you know you're doing the children's hour you know we'll go ahead and do it what does it mean to say something is a symbol anybody have any idea when we're talking about a symbol of something anyone want to 
Okay, do you have an idea of what the symbol is that you can think of? How about when we have communion? What are some symbols there? We have the bread and the juice. That's exactly right, Neil. Thank you. Okay. When you hear someone mention Easter, what are a few things that you think about Easter? Now, remember, you're a small child. So what are some things that you think about when you think about Easter as a small child? <laughs> That's exactly right. And these are really nice things to think about because it's fun to share with your family when you're decorating and dyeing Easter eggs, when you're having Easter egg hunts, it's a family affair. So that, that's really special, but that's not really the Christian meaning of Easter. What special holiday is coming up in three weeks? Three weeks we're gonna celebrate a special holiday. Three weeks. It's Easter Sunday. And I wanna share with you some of the things about Easter Sunday and one of the things that we do around here is we think of Easter and we use our Easter lilies that we have. Now this I couldn't find, I didn't go out and look find any real Easter lilies but these are some flowers that represent the Easter lily and at, uh, in the Bible it mentions three different kinds of flowers. We have crocus, we have lilies, and we have roses. Now I know most of you can identify what a rose looks like if you were a small child, because people like to smell the roses. Well, an Easter lily is a very tall, spiky plant, and it would be in a pot, but it's a tall, spiky plant. It is shaped like a trumpet or a horn, and it has a little, yellow thing inside of it which has pollen on it. Now when you get an Easter lily, if you want it to last longer, you take this out because it stains the flower and doesn't make it look as nice. I like to read my notes because there's lots of things you can find on Google about Easter lilies. Um, if you bought an Easter lily, it would probably have 12 to 15 flowers on it. That's a really good quality Easter lily. And these Easter lilies grow between one and three feet tall. Now sometimes around our campus here at church, you can find some Easter lilies. At the front of the church on the steps, sometimes they're blooming. And out here where we had jonquils, sometimes you can find some uh, really nice Easter lilies. And one of our members, Faye Castle, enjoys planting plants that uh, come from bulbs. The Easter lily comes from a bulb that sits under the ground for approximately three years before it bursts into bloom and you have a beautiful flower. These flowers are very fragrant. They have a very nice smell. Um, and sometimes we think of the three years like when Christ died on the cross and he was in the tomb for three days and then he arose. So that we're trying to use symbolism here to um, think about the Easter lilies. In your bulletin today, you'll find a little flyer. If you are interested in getting an Easter lily for your family, it could be in memory of someone, it could be in um, memorial or honoring someone. So you could turn that in and put it in the offering plate. And on Easter Sunday, we will have all of these Easter lilies in here. Christ arose from the grave in three days. And that's what we're going to show with our Easter lilies in here in the church. This is just some comment for adults. Oregon and California are the states that produce most of the Easter lilies. So I thought that was interesting. If you've ever visited out there, maybe you've seen lots of Easter lilies. I do have, when I really worked hard to get these pages from the coloring book for you to color. So if we had some small children, but I will put them back there in the playground 
so in the next couple of weeks the children can come in and color these Easter lilies. Now it's kind of hard to color a white Easter lily on these pages. Lilies come in different colors. The white is for the purity of Jesus, but the Easter lilies, I've seen green ones, you can have yellow ones, pink ones, red ones, orange ones. So these would be colors that you could use with the crayons that we have back there in the back. So if you were doing your um, artwork today, you could take it home and you could put it on your refrigerator and remember that um, Christ is alive and he's always with you. Let's have a little prayer before we go continue with the service. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity for us together today. Thank you for this beautiful day. And we look forward when we have some more children in our congregation to share information with. Thank you for coming today and being with us. Okay. Good morning. The Congregational Life Committee was actually formed from three different committees. That was worship, fellowship, and congregational care. This is a very active committee here at Amity that's involved in all aspects of congregational life, and we would love for you to be a part of this group. Some of the areas that we participate in are as follows. One, worship leader, just like Miss Ann's doing today. You can help the pastor during the service, that's a volunteer uh, position. Uh, usher team coordinator and leader, coordinating the ushers throughout the year. Communion, helping to set up and take the communion down is very important. It's very time consuming, so it, it's really, if you have more people helping, it makes it a lot easier. The fifth Sunday meals. This year we've decided to do meals on the fifth Sunday, so there'll be four this year, and we've already had one. Our next one will be April 30th. Helping to set up, decorate the tables, uh, take down, and maybe even prepare some food. Also providing flower arrangements when needed. Cards, we send seasonal cards, uh, as well as get well cards to our members. Phone calls. It's easy to make a phone call to someone, to the shut-ins and others in need of support. Visits, we do a lot of visiting here at this church to facilities, nursing homes, people's private homes. Meals, as I said, providing food to members. We've just done that this past week, and it's very important to keep that camaraderie between our members. Transportation. We do a lot of that, providing transportation to church and other related activities. Attending scheduled meetings. We just happen to have a meeting this coming Wednesday. If you're interested, it will be uh, this Wednesday at one o'clock in the Amity Room, which is the building right over here, and we would love to have you come. We will be sending out Easter cards, and we could use some people to address the cards. We've got the cards, the stamps and we just pass them out and get some people so it's in your own writing. Also, the Seekers, it's in your bulletin today, are sponsoring a cleanup next Saturday here at the church starting at 10 o'clock. And we ask if you're interested in doing that, it doesn't have to be hard work, we'll just clean around here in the sanctuary and do some work in Johnston Hall for a couple hours. And then we're gonna go to eat pizza at the House of Pizza on Central Avenue. So if you'd like to do that, just show up here 10 o'clock next Saturday. As I mentioned, this is a very active committee in the life of Amity Church, and of course, we would welcome any members who would like to contribute their time and talent to support Amity. Thank you. Our first scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter five, verses 1 and 21 through 24. 
listen for God's word for us today. Hear this word, Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice, off, choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. The second scripture for today is taken from the book of Micah, chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak king of Moab plotted, what Balaam's son of Beor ordered? Remember your journey from Shittim and Gilal, that you may know the righteousness acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. These are the words of God for God's people this morning. First, I'll say good morning to you all. It is a pleasure to be here worshiping with you. As stated earlier, I am a member and serve as an elder at the Grove Presbyterian Church where my pastor is Kate Murphy. Our pastors are good friends, and before Megan was here, she served at the Grove, and that is how I have come to know and to love her. I thank her for this opportunity to be here. I do not take it lightly to trust the people of your congregation with another preacher when you are not there. I recognize the gift that that is. And because two things can be true at the same time, I am also telling you that I was deeply concerned when she told me what your Lenten series was about, and when she told me the book that she was using where she was creating these sermons for movement in the life of the church during this season. And because I believe that research is important, I reached out and got the book by Cole Arthur Riley, and if you aren't reading it, take a moment and take it in. It is something to behold. And so as she broke down the sermons and told me how she had it set up all the way to Easter Sunday and that this Sunday that I would be speaking to you guys, the service that she had listed, the topic was justice and repair. And I said, oh my, is that really what you want? And I believe even now that God has a word for his people. Pray with me for a moment. 
Holy and righteous God, we thank you for this opportunity, the opportunity to hear from you. God, we ask that this word would fall on fresh ground. God, we ask that as we move throughout this life, God, that that seed that would be planted, that each and every experience that we have, that it would till the ground, that that seed would take root, God, and that we would be changed forever to continue to beautify the landscape of this, your world. Change us, God. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so here we are talking about justice and repair. And when you hear the word justice, because we say it a lot, usually when there's a crime involved, we want someone to get justice. And if we're honest, the flesh in us doesn't really want justice, we want revenge. Someone robs you, yes, you want to be whole, but I also want you to pay for what you did. If someone steals from you, yes, I want my money back, but I also want you to learn the lesson so that you don't do it again. And in that is not justice, but revenge. And it is, a, it is a specific thing that we as Christians, we as children of God must know and constantly be aware of when we encounter one another in this life, when people do us wrong, when systems have their way, when we feel like we've done every single thing right and we still don't get our desired result. Is it? that we want justice, or is it that we want revenge? Think of the situations in your life that appear to have been unfair. Maybe you worked hard for a job. Maybe you studied for a test. Maybe you thought that the person that you loved so much was gonna love you back 100%. And when all the chips were in, you lost. Think of the pain that that caused you. Think of the hurt that you felt on the inside. Now think, what did I want to be made whole? Did I wish them the best with their new love? Did I congratulate the person who got the job I thought I should have gotten? Did I reach out to the teacher and say, I studied as best I could, tell me where I went wrong? Or, or did we like, we, we like to use that scripture of Jesus turning the tables, or did, or did you want to turn some tables over? Did you, want to, did you want to let someone know how you felt? Did you want to share that pain by letting someone else feel pain? It's honest. You're in church. You can tell the truth. You may not have wished the best for that person. But the reality is, is that God calls us to desire justice. God calls us to desire justice. Justice, in many of its definitions, is just about being just. Well, what is being just? Doing the right thing. There's an interpretation that says justice is needed to restore order. Justice is needed to restore order. And so first we have to believe that order existed. We have to believe that. And so now we have to say that justice must happen in order for order to exist, in order for us to be at peace, for order, in order for us to live lion and lamb together, there must be justice. And so what are we to do with that, church? What are we to do with that when our very flesh does not desire that? It is actually a spiritual act because no one can give it to you but God. If you watch any of those crime shows, which I admit I am guilty of, occasionally you will see someone who committed a horrific crime, destroyed an entire family, 
and the victim's family shows up at court to make their victim statement. And many times, many times, people will yell and scream and even curse and say, you destroyed my family. You don't know what you took from us. But the reality is, is that there are others who say, I forgive you, who say, go in peace who say, God's mercy on your soul. Now, does that absolve you from destroying my family? Does that mean you don't deserve a punishment? Does that mean you don't deserve any kind of repercussions for your actions? No. It means that you will go and you will serve your time and you will have your punishment, for that is truly justice. But it is not me trying to eye for an eye. It is not me trying to break it down and have you feel the same exact pain that I'm feeling. Here we are in the United States of America in 2023. Stay with me, I'm not gonna be too dangerous. So there are tons and tons every day you see, even on the news, even in the quiet, quaint city of Charlotte, there's violence everywhere. You shoot me, and so what, what do I do? Now I shoot you. Gang violence is nothing but a cycle of no justice. Over and over again, I'm thinking I'm gonna get you back, and then you thinking you're gonna get me back. And we, as the people of God, stand by and watch it happen. We, as the people of God, know that this does not end well. We, as the people of God, know that there is no justice in that. And so the question is, what is God calling us to do when we see injustice? The scripture that I read today is from the book of Micah. Micah is a prophet. He is a man of God. He hears from God and God gives him direction and he speaks and he gives wisdom and he gives visions to the people. And in our hearts, some of us wish and pray and ask God, life would be so much easier, God, if you would send a prophet into my life so that I could know where I'm going and what I'm doing. But if you really listen to the scripture, Micah came to the people with the word. And the book of Micah is where he is explaining to the people that they will be destroyed. That their behavior is unsightly to God. That the things that they are doing, the rituals that they are having, the festivals and the feasts that they are having, saying that they are having them in the name of God, God is not pleased. And you look at me to say, how, how can that be? Here we are in 2023, getting dressed, coming to church, looking holy, gathering together as God, you have called us to be community with one another. Some of us reading our Bibles and some of us studying and getting deep into the word and asking God to transform our lives. So we think, we know in our soul that God is pleased with us. And I'm sure those people thought the same thing until Micah came into their midst and let them know that their God had been faithful, that their God had delivered them, and they had somehow, some way, gotten away from what God had called them to do. And so here we are thinking that the Bible is a long, long time ago and Micah is dead and gone, so he can't be the one to give us a word. And what I would ask you to do in your prayer life is to ask God to show you the prophets, show you the people in this world living this day that are saying things that you don't want to hear. Look at the world, look at the word, look at where you are and ask the questions. Has God sent someone here to tell us that we're doing it wrong? Has God sent someone here to tell me to examine my life? 
Has God sent someone here to say the things that I believe and the things that I say that I believe, but when it really comes down, when the rubber meets the road and when I'm really forced to make a decision, does my decision line up with what God has put in my heart? And so I told you I wasn't thrilled about this notion of justice and repair on the Sunday when your pastor is not here because it is a hard word. It is a word that rep reprimands all of us. It is a word that lets us all know that there is still more to do. Not just as Americans, or not just as Christians, or not even just as Charlatans. We all in this earth have more to do. And God has called us to do it. The second part of this sermon doesn't just talk about justice, but talks about repair. And honestly, I thought justice would be the most difficult part, but repair turned out to be worse. <laughs> worse, worse, Lord, okay? Because in order to repair something, first you have to acknowledge that something is wrong. You can drive your car, and watch that check engine light and keep driving that car because you can think, well, as long as it still cranks up, I'm good to go. If you live long enough, you will learn <laughs> that that little light is there for a reason. <laughs> and eventually, you may find yourself on the side of 485 with cars whizzing past you in a more dangerous situation. Because the reality is, church, the warning sign was there. The warning was there. And so here we are living our lives, doing what it is that we do. And maybe the term now is red flags. Maybe there are some red flags in our lives. Maybe there are some red flags in our communities. There are some check engine lights that are blinking and we are ignoring them because we can still go to work, and we can still go to school, and we can still send our children to work, and we can still send our children to school, and it is not impacting us in any way. But the flags are there, and the engine light is blinking, and we, holy children of the Most High God, have our heads in the sand believing that God is in control and there is nothing for us to do. If you've been in church just a little while, you have heard that faith without works is dead. And we like to use that scripture when we're telling somebody that they need to get a job or they need to, you know, work towards something or you need to eat healthy to take care of your body. You know, you can believe that God can heal you, but what are you doing? What is the work that you're doing? And sometimes there are problems in this community, in this earth, where we think the problem is so big, we can't fix it. God, racism is a problem. We can't fix it. We're just going to pray, God, and we're just going to ask you to send your miraculous spirit down here and just change it. Just fix it, God, because there's nothing that we can do. There is no work that we can do, God. And if that is your prayer, I charge you to get back on your knees because you're not done. God, there is hunger in the land, and the hunger is so bad and so big that we can't fix it, God. So we're just going to go to you, God, and ask you to do what it is that only you can do, God. If you have had manna fall from the sky, God, to give it to the children of Israel, I know you can do it today. Do it, God. Do it for the hungry. That way I'm not inconvenienced. God, there are poor among us, and the poor are so many, God. We can't fix it, God. There's nothing we can do, God. So we know that you, who are almighty and are all-powerful, you can speak a word and change it all. God, we know you can. It's too much for us. My brothers and my sisters today, I charge you to recognize that you are human, 
And against God, that is a weakness. But in community together, we can create change. The reality is, is that we have to want it. The reality is, is that we have to desire justice, not just for us, but for everyone. Justice and peace, not just for Christians, but for everyone. God is charging us knowing that he sent his only son to die. Not for the Christians or the good people or the blacks or the whites. He loved the world so much. And we say that scripture so much, I think that it's, we've numbed ourselves to what it really means. God loved the world. And the world means people that you will never look eye to eye with. He loved them. People who right now are on the other side of the world sleeping, God sent his son for them. The same way that he sent his son for you. And if we recognize and if we realize that we're in it together, that he did it for all of us, it changes your heart a little bit. It takes a few scales off your eyes for vision. When you realize that it's not us against them, it is we, the children of the Most High God. And so I'll go back to the book that your pastor is reading that she has this series coming to you guys with, and the author weaves in stories of justice and injustice, and she weaves it in with personal stories of her life. And there's one part that I wanted to read to you, and she talks about her father who was addicted to substances. And as many of us know, because we all know someone, whether we know it or not, who is battling with some addiction of some sort, when her father finally went through rehab and it took, because for many people, it's not a quick, easy fix. And so, you know, part of the AANA, you know, the steps and you're trying to go to people and you're apologizing and you're asking, how can I restore? Because our relationship is broken. There's work to do. And that is a great example. And so I want to read to you what she said, the conversation that she had with her father. I asked him how he felt now that he was clean. I didn't even finish the sentence before he said, no, no. You don't feel free, you feel ashamed. It's once you're clean that you remember. You remember the things you did. Once you're clean, you remember and you start asking yourself, what have I done? How much damage did I do? Now, between you and me, that's the reason why we don't want to restore. That's the reason that we don't want to do the work of repair. Because repairing requires truth. Repairing requires being honest about things that we really don't want to be honest about. But the good news that I come to bring to you today is that restoration is better than hiding. Restoration is better than lying. Restoration breathes forth something new that can grow and come forth. We who have been walking with God for even just a little bit of time, know that he can use each and everything. God can use each and every experience in your life, each and every heartbreak, each and every shortcoming, each and every moment when you were shortchanged in your life. God can use it all to create a beautiful tapestry of your future. 
And that's not just for you individually, but that is for all of us as children of God. So in order to really have justice, and in order to really have repair, we have to tell some truths. Now you're getting really, really quiet, so I'm getting a little bit scared, but it's okay, because God is here with me. And um, I came across this poem, and I'm, I'm gonna read it to you, and you may have heard it because it is very, it's very popular. And the reason why I wanna share it with you today is because there are so many people that are dealing with injustice. But the reality is there are some that are not. There are some who are safe every day. There are some who have no worries about certain things because it doesn't even bother them in any way, shape, or form. And so the question is, is that, is that something that we need to spend our energy on as brothers and sisters and children of the Most High God? The word tells us to confess our sins one to another. The word challenges us to pray for one another. The word tells us to take on one another's burden. So there is not a you problem that is not a me problem. If I am a child of the most high God, and if I want God to do all that he can in and through my life. This poem comes from the Holocaust Memorial. The title of it is First They Came. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy and righteous God, we come before you now, God, asking that when we look in the mirror, we would not only see ourselves, but we would see our brothers and our sisters in Christ. God, we ask that as we move through this life, that we would do what you would have us to do. And God, that's to love one another, and that's to fight for justice. God, we ask that you would put the seed inside of us, God, and that it would take root on good ground, that we would do the work, God, that we would push the plow, God, that we would not sit back and just say, do it, God, but we would stand up and say, God, what would you have me to do? God, move within us. God, lead us and direct us. God, change us, for we are your children. God, we come now at this point in the service to pray for the people. God, you know those who are sick. You know those who are hurting. You know those who are grieving. You know those whose hearts are breaking. God, we ask that you would not only see them now, God, but install a miracle, God, something so that when it happens to them, they know it was no one but God. God, we ask that you would move in the hospitals and in the homes right now, God. God, we ask that you would look over the list of names printed in our bulletin of those who are sick and need a touch from you. God, we ask that you would have your way. Have your way, God, in this place. God, we'll take a moment to cry out the names, the names and the people and the places and the situations where we ask that you would do what only you can do. Hear us, God, as we call those names. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Do it, Lord.
Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Lord, we thank you because you are faithful. God, we thank you because we know that you hear us. We know that you are rewarders of those who diligently seek you. And God, we come now seeking you, asking you to do what only God can do. Heal God, turn hearts God, destroy yokes God, break addictions God, lift burdens God. God, we thank you. We thank you God because you love us. We thank you, God. We put our shoulders back and hold our heads high because we know that we are children of the Most High God. Hear us, God, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. There's a familiar Bible story about a boy who shared five loaves and two fish with Jesus because Jesus wanted to feed a large crowd. It was all the boy had. But for Jesus, through Jesus, it was enough. It was enough, more than enough, to feed the crowd. So. Yes, we can receive God's manna from heaven. The thing is, when we share it, it multiplies. You can give to God online through our church website or in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary as you leave. No matter how you give to God, give with joy and trust in the God who loves us so much. People of God, let us rise together and sing the words of Amos the prophet, let justice flow down. Justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever, lead us to the stream that will never run dry. Flow to the mouths of the hungry, flow to the lands of the to the hearts of the orphans, to the ravages of war. Let justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever, lead us to the stream that will never run dry. Just 
Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore.